Okay. Welcome, everyone. I am very excited. Today, I'm going to be discussing Gardens of the Moon with three fantastic booktubers, people I consider great friends. Everybody here has now finished Gardens of the Moon. I'm going to let each of these guys give their impressions of the book thus far. We are only going to have spoilers in a little bit. Initially, I think we'll, we'll go non-spoiler for a while, just give general impressions. And then later we'll have spoilers for Gardens of the Moon, but not for the entire series, especially since Mike hasn't read the series yet. So we cannot have those spoilers for the rest of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. But yeah, Gardens of the Moon will give you a signal or something when we start talking spoilers. In the meantime, though, let me introduce these great people here. You got the four grandpas of, of BookTube here today. <laughs> <laughs> Elder statesmen, I like to say. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure I'm the oldest of us here. Alan, you're just kind of a junior guy here, I think. But uh, 38. I mean, that's pretty yeah. old. You young buck. <laughs> you're a youngster. You're the youngster. I'm like twice the median age of BookTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to tell you what that makes me, but... <laughs> Anyway, uh, we're going to have a great time, uh, whatever your age. Hopefully, you'll enjoy listening to us just gush about Gardens of the Moon. And I uh, just want to introduce these guys real quick here. And I think you probably, if, if you've been watching my channel at all, you know who these three are. But we have Alan from the Library of Alexandria. And we have Iskar Jarek. And we have Mike from Mike's Book Reviews. Cheers. So welcome to all three of you. It is just a privilege and a pleasure to be discussing Gardens of the Moon with you. I am, I, I love talking the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Probably my viewers have noticed that. Uh, I've been doing a, a fair amount of Malazan content lately. I just think that these books are so appropriate for our times. I love the fact uh, that, of course, there's what Iskar calls the badassery in here too, right? There's a lot of action. There's a lot of fun stuff. There's some just fantastic themes in here that just, you know, as, a, as both a fan of the badassery and as a, as a kind of a literature guy, I love the themes. I, I just love them. The emphasis on compassion and on empathy. I mean, what a beautiful message for our times. And you can see it, I think, somewhat in Gardens of the Moon. That's a theme that will unfold throughout the series most beautifully though. And I just think it's so appropriate. So thanks guys for being here. And I guess let's start by having each of you give your impressions of Gardens of the Moon. Who would like to go first? Let's let Mike go. Okay. Uh, well, okay. I am happy to be you guys sweet summer child and the thing that you point at and laugh and say, oh, that's adorable that you think that. But I am very, very happy to be here. I was pleasantly surprised by this book quite a bit i think it's because i had so much fear mongering of people tell me oh well, you just got to kind of soldier through that first book and uh, it was kind of those ones where like books one through three inside of the novel you know it has the seven meta books as i've been trying to because people are like wait you're on book seven already how'd that happen that's not what i mean uh but books one through three i felt like you know what i'm sticking with this pretty good i did a spoiler talk on that people are like i'm surprised you're getting as much as you are and the books through seven kind of four through seven kind of melted my brain a little bit. So I'm hoping you guys can kind of help me with some of that stuff today. But uh, again, uh, I'm happy to be laughed at. And like I said, called a sweet summer child a lot. That's why I'm here. Gladly. And you know what? I also wanted to ask you, Mike, how the read along is going, because you have this fantastic read along that is going on on your channel, on your discord. Where uh, lots of conversation, uh, it's it's still going crazy. There's a lot of people now that are like, "Oh crap!" You know, I'm 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 getting started late, and I'm like, "Well, you still got plenty of time." You know, the way we've got the schedule spaced out, you can kind of jump on whenever you want, depending on how fast of a reader you are. But I probably had about three or four people message me and just say it wasn't for them; they're going to bail. And I expected that a little bit because I mean, you guys probably know that uh, the series is not going to be for everyone. I can definitely see that now. But overwhelmingly positive. A lot of people kind of the same sentiment as me that uh, if this is the worst this series has to offer, man, I'm ready to buckle up. So Awesome. And I should also mention one special reason we wanted to have Mike here today is this is going to be a series, by the way. I don't know if any of the viewers recall, but a couple months back, Alan and Iskar and Andy Smith and I had a video and it was kind of a why you should read the Malazan Book of the Fallen discussion. And it appeared on Iskar Jarek's channel. It was a fantastic discussion. And we decided that we would 
can continue this discussion, discussing each of the 10 books over the course of 10 months together. And we also decided that we would like to have a guest for each of these 10 conversations. And because Mike had been planning his read along, we thought it would be just perfect to have Mike here as our first guest for Gardens of the Moon. In our future videos, we will be having other booktuber guests and other guests. So we're very excited for the lineup we've got there. So thank you so much for having me. And I can't wait to watch those videos once I read them. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So uh, Alan, how about you? Gardens of the Moon. So I am, I am always going to be like, I guess I'm always going to be, Mike, don't even worry about people being like, oh, like, oh, and that's cute. I'm the one that's going to get the hate when people are like, what? What do you mean you don't like that? <laughs> so I love this series. I have, like, that is so hard for people to grasp. Like, I love this series. I have read most of the books. Like, this is my, my fourth time trying to make it through the series. I've read most of the books three times but I just finally finished it last night. I finally finished The, the Crippled God, so I am complete with the series. Um, Gardens of the Moon is not, it's not, it's not my favorite. Um, the first time I read it, Mike, I was like those last, I was like, what is happening? Like, wh what, what is happening in those what last, those last three? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the freaking Finnis, the Zap houses, like what? Um, but um, yeah, so when I started this, uh, 2019, I restarted the series for this final time, uh, summer 2019. I actually skipped Gardens of the Moon because it's the one I read the most and it's the one I remembered the most. So I started with Dead House Gates. Um, I have always been a bigger fan of that Seven Cities storyline that starts with Dead House Gates. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, the odd one out with that. Most people prefer the Darugistan um, storylines, like with Memories of Ice and stuff like that. But I um. I like the Seven City stuff, but but Gardens of the Moon is, is, is fine. Like, I like it. It introduces us to a lot of things that we're going to see a lot more of. It's so much smaller scale than every other book that comes after it. Um, I actually prefer, I really like the Count of Monte Cristo uh, Fett storyline with, uh, with, the, with the crew that hangs out at the Phoenix Inn, except for Krupp, because I don't like Krupp. Um, but... <laughs> I, like, I really like that little band, like Crocus and Marilio. Marilio is one of my favorite characters in the series. And I know I'm kind of alone in that too, but I love Marilio. I love the, the, the people that hang out at the Phoenix Inn. Um, and so I really liked following kind of that storyline and, you know, seeing what the Malisons are doing. Like, why are they in the city? Like, what are you doing? Like, like seeing Malisons as road crew. <laughs> I always love that part where they're like, oh, we're just fixing the roads, you know? Um, <laughs> so I liked it enough to continue the series and it's not, again, I like, I am, I am probably a bigger fan of the like the big like, action, military action moments. And so there's at least one in like every subsequent book. And in this one, the Fed is cool. I do like that, but uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's one of my least favorite of the Malazan novels, but it's, I mean, it's good. I just, I don't love it as much as I love some of the later ones. I think I know why you like Murillo. He could fit into one of those Sebastian de Castell books, right? Yeah. yeah. I got yeah, that I out like of him that. and Relic Nam. It seemed very Castell. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like Nam also. Yeah. So I, I just love that. I just love that crew. Like I love Krupp's part in that crew, even if I don't like Krupp himself. <laughs> I got thoughts on him. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, it's your turn, Iskar. And I know you have a different take on Gardens of the Moon than probably a lot of fans and a lot of people. I actually love your take on it. So uh, how do you find it? I, I love Gardens of the Moon. For me, it was a learning experience as a reader. I'm not like super well read. And so, you know, I have a different take on it, having done the rereads, obviously, than on the first read. But I remember trying to, you know, figure everything out, right? I was trying to uh, where, who's the hero, where's the, you know, all that stuff. And so um, it was, it was good from that perspective, but I like the, uh, the building up of all the kind of mythos of the world too, because I think that's, you know, an ongoing theme is it's like, you kind of have the myth of all these people and they have like the people themselves that you see. And so you're always kind of confronting these legends with the reality of these people and so that part was really cool I also just like the the kind of 
coolness aspect, like that big military climax and stuff that that Alan talked about, you know, that happens on like page 10 or something of the <laughs> book, you know what I mean? And so um, I was just like, wow, what is what is this? And I like, you know, the Anamanda Rate character, even though I guess he wasn't even planned to be uh, a major character in the books originally or whatever, but I was like, wow, this is cool. Giant dogs that um, are magical and do all that. I, you know, I just thought it was uh, a really cool book. I wasn't picking up on anything or anything like that. I was like, really was like, man, they're shooting fireballs and lasers and stuff and there's dogs eating. So I was like, this is cool. Yeah. And there's a marionette. That's Freaking right, the to talking puppets. <laughs> Like what? The first time I read that, I'm like, "What is happening?" I was like, "This is where this series is going." Okay, is then. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's got a little bit of everything, and it's that's one of the things we love about it. And uh, I have to say, I, I just read it for the second time, and this is amazing. And Iskar and can testify to this, and so can Alan, because Alan, you've read it like 50 times, right, Alan? Before you. Uh, <laughs> to the moon like four times okay <laughs> so the second time I, I i read it just so much more you i mean i just can't believe how much i missed the first time and i thought i had a grasp on it but man the second time the other thing for me is and if, this is what i've been saying the first time i feel like i struggled but I ultimately did sort of get it intellectually but I didn't get it emotionally as much as I would have wanted. And the second time, because I'm relaxed, I'm not worrying about mastering everything. I'm not looking at the maps. I'm not looking at the character lists. I am just so immersed and I'm so just emotionally like, wow, this is blowing me away more than anything I've read since I was a 13 year old reading Tolkien. I mean, it is just absolutely transformative for me reading this for the second time. It's like a totally new read in a way, but I, I just can't tell you how much uh, eventually, Mike, maybe you'll read it twice and, and you won't feel quite as confused by those later books, but. I will definitely say that the second time I read it, it was a much more enjoyable experience because I wasn't like, what? I didn't say, what? Yeah, I went into what? it with those expectations. On every page. I'm not gonna understand everything. So just kind of roll with what you can. And like you said, Philip, the, the fact that you don't have to flip to the glossary to see, to check, to remember who people are, that alone keeps you immersed. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of anxiety around trying to figure, you know, connect the dots and stuff that first time that kind of takes you out of the moment or whatever in some ways that I think you don't have the, the second time. Yeah, I actually wish that I had approached it differently the first time that I had been better at allowing myself to just be in the moment and live with a little bit of confusion. And I think I would have been more, uh, not that I wasn't, because I loved it the first time too, but I think it would have made it, made it easier for me to just be along for the ride, you know? So I, that's a problem, that's a, my, my issue really. So I, I have this tendency to want to just master everything. Yeah, I didn't have Mike's attitude going in. And so I was like, I loved the book, but I was like, let's hurry up and get on to the second one because I need answers. You know what I mean? And then, all right, well, then the third, the fourth, the fifth. And so I was like, I read all 10 back to back to back. And then I was like, oh my gosh, what did I read? You'd be happy to know that your videos are what kind of set me in that frame of mind of treat each of these as an anthology series and you're not going to understand everything right away and it'll click later. That's I was... Awesome. I was sold on the series after book two. Book two probably has my favorite moment in the entire series. Great. Um, I'm doing it next month. Can't wait. Oh, man. And so it was hard not to pick up book two immediately, but I was like, no, you made a read along. Stick with it, damn it. <laughs> I was a lot sold. of people already, already said, screw it. I got to pick up book two. After yeah. Dead House Gates, I was in it. It's unbelievable. I would like to second what you just said earlier, Mike, too, about Iskar's videos. I think he's been spreading the good word like no one else. And I think it's just fantastic. So there's some great videos in there for people just trying to dip their toes into this world, sort of what to expect kind of videos. Very, very helpful. So yeah, he's done uh, just, I just commend you, Iskar, for that. Great job on that. I've been the watching, reason I called him the most bomb ass Malazan channel on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't come lightly. I've been watching uh, Iskar's uh, Memories of Ice, like chapter, like breakdown things. It's so helpful. Like it just breaks it down into layman's terms. Like this is what's happening going here. And, you know, I've read Memories of Ice three times and I'm still like, that's what that is. Okay. That makes a little more sense.
I enjoy the the public service aspect of it because I think you know if you take take a little bit of the edge off, people are going to really enjoy it. Yeah. Yep, for sure. So while we're still in the non spoiler section, I think we've hit onto a good theme here. Anything else that we want to tell? Maybe prospective readers, maybe somebody who's still thinking about jumping into the read along on Mike's channel. What are what other things can we say to a a new reader to Gardens of the Moon, or maybe somebody who's thinking about reading it? Any advice that you would like to give or impressions? Uh, what I would say is um, just if you want something that's fresh and unique, because a lot of these long series like this, everyone will tell me, you should read it. It's totally unique and fresh. And I'll read book one. I'll be like, this feels very derivative of something else that I've read before. Hi, Will of Time. And it's one of those things where I was like, this, this definitely doesn't feel like anything else I've ever read before. And it feels like Erickson said, I'm just going to go for it from go. Because I got through chapter two of this book and I was like, well, I wasn't expecting that so early. So yeah, right away, I was I was hooked from chapter two onward. So uh, just uh, go into it, just not knowing what to expect. And I don't see how you can't be surprised. But again, be patient. That's all I'll say. Be patient. I would definitely, um, I would definitely be prepared to, like, I didn't, when I first read it, I didn't understand, I didn't understand what was going on at Pale. Like, I had no, like, I'm like, okay, okay. But I had no idea what was going on. And then the the, the very next section in Itka Khan, with uh, the dogs, I had no idea. So <laughs> get past those, understand that you may not have any idea. And when I when you finish the book, I would go back and reread those first two sections because they make so much more sense. Uh, once you finish the book, it's like, oh, okay, once you've kind of acclimated, then Pale and Itka Khan make way more sense because I did not understand anything that was happening in those first two sections, anything the first time I read it. Um, and then, and then it helped. And even, even just knowing the freaking, like just going in, knowing the ancient races, like what the Amas, the Amas and the Jagat, going in, knowing what the Amas and the Jagat are, blew my mind and how much more I understood it uh, the next time around. Because, you know, the Amas and Jagat are mentioned so often in, in this first book, especially, that I was like, what, what? Oh, okay, undead humans and undead orcs, like big orc, like that the like that the Amas Like just, just that helped me understand, uh, understand more. And I don't really know why, it just, it just helped me kind of grasp more. You guys are making me feel good about saying Talani Mas, not Talan Imas, so uh, that's yeah. all. There you go. There is yeah. there is no consistency of pronunciation in this group at all. Just pronounce it how you want. Right. Is it Krupa? Is it? I had people get mad because I was saying croup, and they're like, "No, that's just wrong." And I'm like, "You know, the, <laughs> the the funny thing is, I I had the opportunity, as you guys know, to to have a, a chat with Stephen Erickson and with uh, A. P. Canavan, who the latter is, of course, doing this series with me of reviews of the ten books, and uh, what a blast! And by the way, don't let me forget. Uh, Alan, you were talking about how crazy pale is. AP had the the, the greatest analysis of that, and with the introduction of chaos into the narrative. Iskar, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, it was bomb. So anyway, um, Steven Erickson is so chill about how people pronounce things. Thank goodness. He is so nice about it. I, I don't think he really minds. And if he doesn't mind, then you know who should be, you know dictating pronunciation so uh, it's audio bookers are usually like that but from what i've heard the audio book pronunciations are all wrong too so they're inconsistent yes. rather and they change yeah, yeah halfway through yeah so yeah I, what i heard is they did not consult steven erickson when they made the first audio books and then later they asked him oh how do you pronounce all this and so yeah <laughs> it's a little inconsistent there too so hey what the important thing is we read the books and then we love them right sure yeah that's right. And we all yeah. know, you're we talking all know about them. Talking. Sorry. Yeah. Man. That you're saying them, I think is more important than how you're saying them. So. Correct. We all know who you're talking about, no matter how you pronounce it. So. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Any other non spoiler insights for our Gardens of the Moon perspective readers or people thinking? I would about say, you know, stay off Google. I wouldn't be uh, the Google autocomplete's really going to wreck your day if you get into that kind of stuff. And even the wiki, although I think they do a, a decent job, you know, I'd find a good 
Discord where they're respectful of spoilers or like talk in the comments of non-spoiler, you know, videos that are labeled um, because that can really mess things up. I still like my, you know, kind of mystery analogy, again, not being super well read, but that's how it felt to me. And that's kind of how I coped with the anxiety of not knowing any everything and just say that, you know, answers are going to come when they're supposed to come and you're not supposed to know everything. And so just, you know, enjoy all the lasers and fireballs and eventually you're going to figure everything out. Yeah. I all the time do not Google. Yeah. I just, I just want to make sure that I was spelling someone's name, right. And it told me when they died. So yes, don't. Oh. Ever <laughs> I've, oh. I've gone on the wikis before just cause I'm like, I'm like, okay, I didn't really understand what happened. Let me go look in the wiki. And when you click on a character wiki, it said died. And this, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to wait for that to happen. I had a couple of things spoiled uh, just because I wanted to seek understanding. Like you said, the, the best way is, a, is like a discord or find someone. Like if you find really nice people who aren't going to be like, you don't know that idiot. Like if you find some nice people, like you'll ask them questions and they'll, they'll either tell you or they'll say, read and find out, which is like, oh, okay, I'll leave this for now. It's going to be answered later. And that always makes me feel good knowing that an answer is coming then I can just kind of like quell my anxiety. Be like, I got to know, I got to know. Yeah, I will say that the people on Mike's Discord and the people on Iskar's Discord are all exceptionally, my interactions with them have all been so positive. Just, you know, great, positive place. Nice, just, you guys have built some really wonderful I think on both of our servers, people are just glad that more people are reading it. So they yeah. definitely don't want to spoil anything. They're just, you know, eating popcorn and just, just having a good time watching all the Ridiculous theories being thrown around, I'm sure, right now. <laughs> yep. Sometimes it's fun to find out how wrong you were. So, yeah. So, happens awesome. all the time. Yep. I was very wrong about how the series was going to end. <laughs> did not end how I thought it was going to end. Yeah. Alan just finished The Crippled God. He's not going to talk about it because no spoilers for that. But, congratulations, Alan. It's quite good. It's quite good. Nice. Nice. Good endorsement there. So, it was, it was it's good to know since I've invested two years into this. So it's good to know that it has a good ending. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be helpful to know, I suppose. Uh, so great. All right. I feel like we are on the verge of some spoilers. So perhaps we should warn our viewers. Viewers, we are going to talk spoilers now. So if you don't want to hear spoilers for Gardens of the Moon, not for the series, we're not going to spoil the rest of the series, just Gardens of the Moon. We don't want to you know, mess up the series for anyone. Uh, so yeah, this is your time to bail and thanks for coming and we hope to see you again. Great dead house gates. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do we want to talk first in terms of spoilers? Uh, Does Animander break a dragon or is he just like possess dragons? <laughs> okay, read and find out. <laughs> okay, All right. <laughs> I think we can explain that what the uh, soul taken are, can't we, without oh, spoiling? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mike, yeah. understanding Deadhouse Gates, knowing what freaking soul taken and divers are, will help you so much yeah. in Deadhouse Gates. Soul taken are uh, shapeshifters that can turn into one thing. Oh. Divers are shapeshifters that can turn into like a like a horde of rats, like multiple things, hmm. and. That's where I actually learned the word divers that means many things. Like divers is another, it's like an old timey word for many. And I learned that from here. Thank you, Erickson. But uh, like that will help you so much in book two. Just right, understand. We'll, we'll start taking notes here. All right. <laughs> and I did take notes. I'm not going to lie. I took lots of notes. Rake, does Rake remind anybody of Sephiroth? Like he's long white hair, huge sword, mom issues. Like, <laughs> That's, every time I read it, I'm like, it's freaking Sephiroth. I got Fuck Elric, off. but and you know what? I've never read Elric, so that's just going off of the old comic book covers I used to see in my uh, brother's bedroom. So, gotcha. Yeah, Steven Erickson is on the record saying he had not read Michael Moorcock before writing the Malazan books. So Elric is... Hey, is I don't awesome. care. It's an awesome character. So Yeah, yeah. I got to read those books at some point. No, I haven't read the Elric books yet, but... Um, no, I mean Rake. Rake's an awesome character. I'm sure oh, Elric is, is too, but yeah. Rake is just awesome. Him him, and... Uh, gosh, who else? Too many characters floating in my head right now, but yeah. Rake and I think Onos Toulon was probably like the coolest fantasy characters I've come across in a while. Nice. I, I didn't expect Lord. to like Tool like uh, I did. He's awesome. What were you saying, Alan? I don't think Lorne gets enough love. Like, I really like Lorne in this first book. I, I understood know, her, yeah. 
yeah, I didn't like her necessarily as a as a person, but I loved her as a character. And I think it was such an interesting dynamic because she kind of goes back and forth, right? She has like all this internal conflict where she's like, you know, from one chapter to the next, she's going from like ride or die for the for the empress no matter what. And then to like, what are we doing? And having these like existential crises and stuff. And then just her ending. Like the, and all the last shreds of humanity that she had kept getting whittled away over yep. and over again so yeah it's nice in service layers. to the empire and this is exactly what i mean about the themes so and, and as you said iskar it's in service to the empire we all live in these we're little cogs in the great big wheel here and this can just you know absolutely you know whittle away your humanity as you said mike and the thing about lauren is yeah ultimately she does we're talking spoilers here so she does make the wrong decision from a moral perspective she is a good soldier from you know another perspective but what i love about her character and about others we can go back to Anamanda rake as well these characters are complex they are conflicted and if you think you know a character in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, if you think you have judged a character appropriately, like you've categorized the character, good, bad, or whatever, guess what? You're going to be challenged in that assumption because I know no other series that is as brilliant at challenging the notion that you can separate the world into good and evil. It's just so amazing how he will, Erickson will give you an entirely new perspective on a character you thought you knew. And Lauren in the in just this book does that for me. I, I felt deeply sympathetic to her. Could you imagine what happened to her as a kid to become the adjunct of the Empress? I mean, just what kind of training that would have involved and how probably they did try to strip the humanity from her. So and, and then this person is just trying to break through that, you know, and she was, as we know, she was orphaned because of what Tattersail, we love Tattersail, right? Well, guess what? Tattersail killed her family or she was involved in it. And, it, you know, there's that whole dinner scene when, you know, Tattersail shows up and suddenly you see this character so differently because Lauren's saying, oh yeah, I remember you. You're the one that, uh, you know, killed my family. Thanks a lot. So that, that was intense. And just suddenly the rug is swept out from under you. You, you, you suddenly realize, oh, I don't know this whole character. I, you know, I don't know everything about this person just from this interaction. There's more to this person. It's amazing. Well, we see that, Philip, even in just the, the, the central conflict between uh, the bridge burners and Darugistan. Like, yeah. we're like, yes, Risky Jack, Fiddler, Hedge, yes, they're the good guys, like, be like betrayed at pale or whatever. Right. And, but at the same time, we're like, wait, no, don't take over to Rujistan. We like these guys. Like we like Crocus and, and Marilio and Krupp. And, and, and like, why do we want them to be under the empire? We want them to be yeah. free. But we also want the bridge burners to succeed. Yeah. And what are the yeah, bridge burners doing there? First too. They, they are booby trapping the streets where innocent <laughs> people are going to be blown up. Right? I know. All, all in the cause of the, that, that I love that like that that theme all the way all the way to crippled God. There's a line in crippled God about that very thing in service to the empire, right? Like, ah, oh, I love I love that stuff. The stuff that is all like, what are you gonna do in service of you know in service of the empire? Like Iskar was saying, it's uh, yeah. One of the things yeah. that stood out to me early was the whole idea of, okay, in a traditional fantasy tale, the bridge burners are your heroes, right? That's your bridge four for you Sanderson people. You're thinking, okay, this is the group that you're going to root for. And you're like, but you know, they are kind of working for this, uh, this big corporate entity that's taking over all these free, the last couple of free cities on this continent. And it's that thing where like, hey, you know, sometimes really good people work for some bad dudes, you know? So it was, a, I like that a lot, very Abercrombie-ish and that there is no clear defining lines of good or evil. Especially, I hate the Empress. I hate Lacine. I hate the Empress so much. Anyone think Surly is a better name than Lacine? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't she a like? Wasn't she like a barmaid? At Bar the, wench or something? At, uh, <laughs> it's a hell of a promotion. Well, I don't know if you want. Do you? I mean, this would be a spoiler for the prequel. This would be a yeah. spoiler for Path to Ascendancy. You know, so I don't know you if get I a want lot to of tell backstory. You. Yeah, you, you go back you, there. You get. If you want to know. Out her backstory read path to ascendancy alan oh. you're gonna love it path to ascendancy i'm, I'm excited 
you would like that. Okay. Can I ask a question about like that? Uh, one thing I want to know, one of my biggest questions I have is how did race get in this tomb and who put him there? Is that answered in a prequel book? It's answered in the in this in the series. In the rain series? Oh, okay. That, that's the biggest thing I was like. I was like, this so, kind of seemed like it came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, they're talking about this dude that's been buried in this tomb. Like, well, who put him there? Why is he there? Who, you know, yeah. how long has he been there? All those that, that that is answered in Gardens of the Moon. So this is not a spoiler. Raced is a jagged. He was a jagged tyrant, meaning mm. most jaggeds actually what they did way, 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 way back, like hundreds of thousands of years before the Malazan story takes place they walked away from civilization they basically said civilization makes us do some really evil stuff let's just not do it anymore and so they were they were convinced by this really interesting jagged whom you're going to meet later um but you've probably seen i think there are some quotes from his book already is that right iskar yeah in in, in the arms so. of the moon yeah. but basically they walked away from the evils of civilization they chose to live isolated but there are there is occasionally a jagged who would decide to kind of go rogue, if you will, and become a tyrant because they're very powerful. And so, Raced is one of those for his own personal reasons. Uh, I won't get into that, but he decided to just take over. Like he can he could dominate lesser beings like the Tlan Imas. So yeah. they he basically um, took over a big area or whatever, but the other jagged decided, no, we can't let this happen. And so they banded together and they're the ones, the other jagged are the ones who imprisoned raced in this tomb, if you will, to basically keep him away from, um, from dominating. Why didn't, why didn't they just kill him? That doesn't make for a very good story, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> why kill him? Or why didn't the Imas kill him? Like. Well, if they just killed him, then what, what would Lorne and Tool have to unleash on Darugistan? No, no, that's that's not a good enough reason. <laughs> I, I got what? most of what you what you said, Philip. I guess I just I, I guess and I know that there's things that I, I probably did miss. Even though I, I will say this feels like my first reread on my first read because I'm rereading a paragraph as soon as I finish it. But uh, yeah, I guess I missed the part about the about them actually banding together and, and, and throwing them in there. So I figured it was something that I was gonna get some flashback story of like Kaladin Brood throwing him in there or something like that. I thought maybe I was going to get something like Freaking that. Brood. Which yeah, I had to think he was jack shit about now, right? <laughs> it's about Kaladin Brood so far. I was just like, okay. That's right. And his hammer. Yeah, though, there's another character. If you read the prequel, in this case, the the, uh, the Carcanus trilogy, there's a, oh my God, you're going to learn about him. And it's, there's a lot of great stuff, but we can't talk about because of spoilers, but but anyway, yeah, did we want to talk about Anamander Rake? Because he Always. is a favorite of everybody except Alan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just go ahead and get mine out of the way. Like Rake is fine. I everyone loves Rake. I don't I don't love Rake as much as everybody else does. Um, just because like I I don't know. I don't he's I don't know how to say it. Like he's just he's been he's hundreds of thousands of years old. And so it's he's kind of a drag to me like <laughs> he is. Wait, what like, have you got against old age i mean nothing except that he's kind of a drag he's just the character like he's really like super uh you know introspective and you know and again he, i'm not saying he doesn't have reason to be like he's gone through a lot but he's just one of these eight and i'm just like i much prefer uh i mean tool's old too but like you know, Tool is more involved, but I much prefer the guys on the ground, Fiddler and uh, and Whiskey Jack, and like I said, Marilio. I, I prefer the 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 shorter lived characters, really, mostly, just because uh, they don't they don't sit and ruminate on like, oh, I'm I'm ageless and I'm lonely because I've been alone for. He so does long. got some emo things going on there. He does yeah. tell Baruch about. I'm not, that. I'm not a huge fan of the emo characters, and so, but I understand that Rake is objectively cool, like. Yeah. He turns into a freaking dragon. He's got an enormous sword. Like that, I will acknowledge that. While while he's just he's just not my favorite. So I, he, I don't want to say underrated because I, I know that a, a lot of people will probably rated. tell me it, uh, he either completely is or completely isn't. But I'll just say that I think that Rylak Nam was one of the coolest guys because he has two duels in this and they're both awesome. One is just like boom, it's done. That that made me laugh because I was expecting another awesome sword fight and it's like yeah. two moves and it's done. Again, that made me think of Falcio or something from uh, yeah. from. Uh, from uh, the great coats, but uh, oh 
his fight with Ocelot, that was some of the coolest stuff. And then when people were saying like, oh yeah, Erickson's action isn't his forte. Well, I'm like, well, shit. What? I thought that was awesome. No, no, no. Yeah. Who said that? And people I, tell me that. Fight? People tell me his character work ain't that good. And I was like, look, I this book had what? Probably 50 characters at least. And I felt like I could differentiate all of them. I thought that the humor was is a very underrated part of this book, mostly coming from Tool, which I, I love. But uh, yeah, all the complaints I heard about his writing style, I don't, I didn't see any of that in this book. And so if you're I, telling me he gets better, by wait. the way, with the action, Stephen Erickson is actually a fencer, so he knows what he's talking about oh, when, good. He, when he does like sword fighting and stuff like that. He knows his business. That's what makes Castell's book so good. Yeah, I love the action. I don't know what someone's talking about. I will challenge. Pale alone to me was just like this is amazing, and this will never be able to be filmed on on a movie screen. Sorry, this is never happening. <laughs> it would cost a bazillion dollars. <laughs> The Darujistan rooftops, you know, the Assassin Wars. Yeah. There's all kinds of, of goodies. Like you can be into the philosophical stuff, but you can also just be there for the for the entertainment value of it. Dodging the crossbow by bending over to pick up the coin. That's so yeah. good. I was like, okay, hey, take Tallow. He's giving me some backstory on this Tallow character. I feel like this. I'm going to like this character. Oh, never mind. He's dead. That was very ever <laughs> <Abercrombie. laughs> But he, more than compensated for by Relic Nam, I think. So yeah, yeah Relic Nam is awesome. I like him. Uh, what do you not like about uh, Krupp or Kruppa or whatever you want to call him, Alan? What do you not like? Because I'm indifferent. It seems like everyone in the Discord loves him, and I'm like, I'm kind of indifferent. I don't know what's going on during his chapters. Krupp makes the book 50 pages too long because uh. he speaks in third <laughs> person in these really long. Pa- oh, you have joined Krupp today for all oh, such a delectable. <laughs> Oh, oh, literary analysis here and we read the pages on here and Krupp is, oh, he is a flustered and oh, Krupp can has, oh, oh this is the... <laughs> this is the voice I'm going to hear in my head for the rest of the series when he talks right. now. I'm just like, Krupp, shut up! <laughs> Hush! <Sure>. Now, <laughs> Krupp being the eel is That awesome. surprised me. That shocked the hell. He would have been my That's tenth awesome. guess. Well, that's what's so so good about Krupp is that, you know, it's actually like, you know, based on him being, uh, you know, actually having all this prescient knowledge and stuff and being so keyed in and everything. And so, hey, you get like a lot of comic relief. He's taken like a lot of digs at himself and other people. Um, I love right. when like, I think Cole is... Uh, like all passed out drunk in the Phoenix Inn. And he's like, you know, what what poisons spill forth from yon? Like whatever, he's just always trash talking everyone and himself. So I, I like that aspect. And then the fact that he's like this criminal mastermind at the end is like, oh my gosh, makes me love him even more. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh so, yeah, I was just gonna agree with Iskar and thank him for saying that because one thing that doesn't get remarked on enough in my opinion is the humor in these books. Definitely. I love Krupp for that. I just think he's, a fan- especially when I imagine him with Alan's voice. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't be able to unhear that the rest of the way. Just before I forgot, I just wanted to bring up Cole. Cole is one where I, I realized, okay, there are no throwaway characters here. Cause I thought, oh, he's just gonna be like some dumb drunk red shirt, right? Yep. And there's that campfire scene with him and Ganos that I was just like, wow, that was amazing. And I was like, wow, so this is actually an important character. I would have never guessed that with the way that it started where I thought he was just some drunk. That, that, so again, differentiating all these characters and making them all seem important is a really, really good first step for sure. I love that whole Count of Monte Cristo story. Like, what yes, to so them. good, so good. Yeah, and I love that campfire scene too. Yeah. That's a great scene. That was where I went from thinking Ganos was just like a kind of a love noble him. little prick to think, okay, this guy's actually got some depth to him. So yeah. I like, I like him a lot. I like him a lot. Speaking of which, did you think he was dead when he was dead? Yeah. I, I think I actually said holy Abercrombie out loud because I was like, <laughs> okay, we're gonna set up three chapters and but, but then like right away the next chapter with like Hood's Gate and all that stuff. Yeah. Awesome. I couldn't get enough of stuff like that. I, I love that Philip. gate being made out of dead bodies. So cool. Yeah. Good stuff. Philip and Iskar, we we jumped off of Rake before you guys gave your Okay. Opinion. Yeah, I'm sorry, that was my fault. I do. Oh no. I it's do it. Too. What to talk about? Sorry. I do I'll, it too. I, I'll take Rake cuz I I like him. I think he's, you know, he I don't think he's overrated. He's definitely rated though, right? But uh, <laughs> you know, I I I like him because, you know, not just for him being a total badass. I mean, like him taking down those two hounds of shadow just like, you know, you get all this build up of like how these are like these ancient. Some people don't even know about them. They're super hardcore. And then like Rake comes up and he's like, "Don't 
you know, don't sick your dogs on me, basically. And then he just takes them down like super easy. So there's like definitely lots of badass or he turns into a dragon and comes down and takes on this demon at the end and all that stuff. But I, you know, he's interesting because he's kind of like for how how emo he is. He's he's actually straddling straddling kind of like regularness and and like the whole rest of the Tist and E because like you know he's interjecting himself in the middle of this crisis where they don't really have a dog in the fight just because like he kind of is bored or needs something to do he thinks it's the morally right thing to do and he's kind of dragging his people along with him and so just the fact that he can even muster uh, the wherewithal to care about stuff like this I thought was was pretty cool and. You know, he's also just, you know, zero sense of humor. Like, I loved how he showed up at the FET and his mask is like a dragon with white hair. It's like, bro, zero imagination whatsoever. Eight feet he does it with zero iron. People don't know who he is. Come on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like classic. But I, I liked him for that because it's like, man, poor guy's been around. They have like nothing to live for. Their goddess is gone, whatever. And they're just like kind of, you know, limping along or whatever. And he's like, you know what? this is BS. I'm going to get involved in this. And he like drags his whole, you know, clan with him. So he, he's cool for that. In addition to just being a total badass. Yeah, I agree. I'm so glad you brought that up, Iskar, because uh, when I was talking to AP about Anamander Rake, he said some really cool things about him in regard to basically the, as you said, the Tice and D have lost their, their mother, their goddess. They have no purpose for their existence it's a little depressing. And Anamanda Rake is trying to give them a sense of purpose. And he is doing this by actually stopping this empire from taking over. So he's actually a force. And even though he's introduced, we talked about how Erickson plays with tropes or upends tropes. I mean, Anamanda Rake is introduced as the, the dark Lord. He's introduced as the stereotypical bad guy. He's actually, uh, actually a force for uh, good and, and sacrifice. And so he's a, a pretty, I, I love the depth to this character. There's just a, a lot that I think he does with Anamander Rake that makes him very cool. And you'll notice that Anamander Rake is never a perspective character, which is a very smart choice on the part of Steven Erickson because how do you write a character who's like hundreds of thousands of years old? What would his thought processes even be? Well, it's, I mean, it's he does like, with Sam. Uh, in the later books, isn't true. Sam, so true. He does he does get a little bit of those later. Yeah, that is true. But I don't think she has quite the status that he no, has. No. So <laughs> by keeping him a non-perspective character, he basically preserves an aura of mysteriousness about Rake, which I think is really strategically pretty cool. So, well, and certainly with all that Rake has going on, like to put a perspective chapter, it'd be like, well. Like we it kind of give some of it away with all the balls he's got in the air. Um, yeah. Speaking of Rake opposing the Malazans, I to this day want to see freaking Black Dog Swamp. Like, why is there not a book about Black Dog? I want to see. I want to see that. I don't know. From your every lips time they, to God's ears. Yeah. Every every time they refer to it, I want to go. I want to. I wish there was you know a book about that. Yeah. Oh, so before I forget about the awesomeness of Pale, and I don't know if you guys want to talk about that some more, but. I mentioned AP, his thing, his theory on that was, so it's the only part of the book where you get the flashback, right? So initially we're confronted with this carnage where, you know, um, what's his name? Hairlock is, is cut in half, right? And his guts are streaming out and, and <laughs> there's the, the whole, you know, the Malazan army is just like annihilated and there's just carnage and, and the, the uh, yeah, so, then we get the, what happened to lead up to this kind of thing. And so AP's observation there was, I thought really cool because the magic was so intense, this eruption, this cataclysm of magic that, and you don't need to know a ton about the Warrens, but one thing you should know about the Warrens, and maybe this will be helpful to you, Mike, um, is that the Warrens are, are, are these basically different realms, if you will, but they all touch on chaos. Chaos is sort of this thing that sort of, surrounds them all. And this eruption of magic basically was so vast, so intense that chaos bled into the scene. And therefore we get the aftermath before the events leading up to it. So it was kind of like chaos disrupting the narrative, if you will. I thought that was kind of a neat idea. 
Yeah, I still don't get it. Love right. it. <laughs> <laughs> From what I understand at this point, the characters don't even get it. So, yeah. I hate Hairlock. I think that should be said. Hey, he's your favorite chew toy. <laughs> Hairlock's the worst. Like, in, like, I just picture him as one of those, you know, when like artists get those, those figure dummies that can, those little uh, posing things that have like multiple joints, but they like have no face. You know, those, those figure things that artists look yeah. at. While I, I was, was reading it, I said, Quick Ben did him dirty, but I ain't mad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm I glad. stand by my, my Michael Keaton casting for Hairlock if they ever did the, the voiceover for that, because he'd be the craziest, perfect uh, nuts Hairlock. So he's one of those characters. Before you move away from Warren's, can I ask a question about power levels in this? Because the whole race isn't even at full strength yet, and he's taking on five dragons and like holding his own, basically. And that's the point where I was like, I don't think I can wrap my head around the levels of power being used in this series so far, because Crazy. it's just like, I haven't seen, I mean, I've read tons of Sanderson. I've read all kinds of stuff with crazy magic systems. And this is just somewhere else, right? I mean, just the level of power. I mean, it's like world crushing kind of stuff. So yeah. race, race has access to an elder Warren, right? Is that right, Philip? Yeah. Yes. Compost black. Yeah, because he's a jagged, he has an elder Warren, which is more powerful than like the baby Warrens that the the humans and stuff. And what about the magic acorn? <laughs> that is a finest. The and finest. Get, and, oh, it's an Azeth house. I'm like, what's an Azeth house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I feel like just you're answering ready, my question Mike. with a question. <laughs> Mike, just get ready. Just get ready for your Azath houses, like freaking left and right. Oh, so great. yeah, the Azath are a mystery that even the gods do not completely understand. So don't worry, Mike, if you don't either. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm not worried, but I definitely don't get it. <laughs> they're like, yeah. well, the Azath houses can like, they're like teleport portals. Like they can connect wherever there's an Azath house. You can, you can go from oh, one they're, of them. They're, they're way gates. Okay. Quick yes. travel. But like everyone can't use them. Like mm. the people, there's almost no one that knows how to use them, but they do connect. Um, and that's really what they're used and and time doesn't really pass inside them that's what they're used for the most in this main series right guys you is that can, is, yeah missing? totally no and you continue to find out more okay Once you'll you got find the, more like, this, it was <laughs> i was like i'm just gonna kind of go along with it now yeah well that kind of goes to your original question too of like you know pow power levels and all that stuff too because even amongst his peers uh rakes or uh race was you know kind of like uber level uh you know and that's why it took tenor or whatever to come and subjugate him and i think maybe also like to you know um alan's question about why they didn't just kill him off right because i think he had just so many people subjugated under him like i mass bone casters which that you know sense. apparently when they have all these bone casters under him then they're like really even next level amounts of power and all that stuff and so the the, all the jagat come together to to put him down and they couldn't maybe kill him off and so they you know took his essence basically and poured it into this acorn and so he's like this hollowed out husk that's imprisoned and then the acorns just sitting there not able to be used did i know what a bone caster is they're talana moss like mages like shaman shaman, oh, shaman. okay all right. all right you'll see them in the in dead house gates you'll see uh great yeah first ones in dead yeah. house gates and so that's one other thing you should know that Iskar was talking about with the Azath. They also serve as a kind of prison uh, for very powerful entities. So that's something else to know. Um, yeah, and especially for Deadhouse Gates. Yeah. 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 So are there consequences to, uh, was it Bralik Nam and is it Borkin? He grabs and runs into the place at the end and that's kind of where it ends. I mean, I'm guessing there's consequences to that that I will find out about in like two books, right? Yep. No. You will nope. find it in many books okay <laughs> i was just trying to think of where everyone ended and i was like did he did it end with him running in that house with her okay you right. will have forgotten relic nom and vorkin by the time <laughs> you learn about what happens what happened with rally i was like oh that's right they are characters in this i forgot back from <laughs> Yeah, it's a hot minute before we find Sorry, out. I have a billion questions, so I'm sorry if I keep stepping on your topics, Philip. <laughs> so, no. Like, I finished the book last night, and I spent an hour and a half in my Discord talking to two people who have read the series multiple times, like, asking them. And they were so nice, helping me understand the stuff that I awesome. didn't get in Crippled God. So I, I think this is a, a, um, a normal place to be at. Definitely. Nice. Yeah, Mike, by the way, if you have questions, we love them. So yeah, anything you want to ask about is, is good.
Good well, for us. When I'm doing those spoiler talks, I'm like, look, guys, these are rhetorical questions. I don't want you to answer them if they're going to ruin anything for me. I'm just thinking out loud. So I have no problem getting raffled. Please tell me to read and find out, uh, definitely. But is there stuff that you guys can answer, like the Azath house thing? I, I appreciate that. And the dragon shifting. Like, again, I didn't know if he became a dragon or if he possessed yeah. a dragon or, yeah. I always like answering questions because most of the time I can't. Like, there's so many questions I can't answer. So it's like, oh, I know that one. I know that one. Like, most of it's like I have to, like, ask people who know more than I do. Oh, and so, by the way, some of those dragons are also soul taken, but dragons can also just be dragons. So, like, Solana is a dragon, right? They're called Elliant. So they right. real, the, the real dragons, not the shapeshifter dragons, are called Elliant, and they're way more powerful than the soul taken dragons um you become a soul taken dragon by drink drinking the blood of of the of the elegant yeah yeah something like that yeah yeah um but have we talked about the bridge burners and whiskey jack and fiddler oh, yeah. and, and marant munitions that is what i forgot that is what sold me on freaking gardens of the moon marant munitions they have freaking grenades <laughs> in this book and every book where they're using Marath munitions, I'm like, yes, get a now you got to suspend disbelief because those people get knocked around a lot without their backpacks blowing up. But stick Marath, Marath munitions, guys, bombs, throwing bombs at people. Oh, I, 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 I love it. I'm still too. with the Marath. I'm still trying to decide if they're actually bug people or if they're just bug cosplayers. I haven't really <laughs> Me decided too. yet. Me too. <laughs> Doesn't matter. They have bombs. That's all you need to know. That's all that matters is they have bombs. The bridge yeah, burners, I think, in general, but all, but the sappers in particular really yes. do just capture the the essence. And I think there's a couple like chapter epigraphs too that are dedicated to the sappers that just really, um, you know, but they're that kind of uh, roguish element, the camaraderie, but where they're always trash talking each other, but where they're really, um, you know, where the rubber meets the road, they're, they're like the most competent people. And that's like, also a cool theme of the books too, is like, and that's what makes the empire so efficacious and conquering all this stuff, right? Is because they're kind of at that inflection point militarily where most people are still, um, you know, shields and spears kind of thing. And they're like, hey, we have bombs. So, you know, all of that is I awesome. like the bridge burners right away. And I was stunned kind of after I finished, I started listening to a uh, 10 very big books, the podcast. Yeah. And they all said they, they didn't really care for the bridge burners. They liked the Daruja stand crew better. And I was like, not me, man. I wanted to get back to the bridge burners at first. Cause I, I thought they were all awesome. I loved all of them. Both the, um, the bridge burners also, and, and like the malice and empire is also really effective the same way the Romans were effective in that before the Romans, uh, individual soldiers didn't have a lot of autonomy within their groups, and the Malazan Empire for sure gives the soldiers, especially the sappers who have no respect for any kind of authority at all. They're like, screw you, we're just gonna go blow something up. Um, that, that autonomy really helped the Romans like take over the known world, and it's helping the Malazans as well. That's why everyone throughout all the books are like, what is up with these freaking Malazans? And they're just like, they're a different breed of people. I, they I can like improvise can. and Mm -hmm. all that stuff i can't remember her name but the one when, when gandos first shows up and you know he's like i'm in charge and she like won't even stand up and like salute him or anything she's just sitting there like cleaning her sword or something and being like yeah he's into a gambling I, I was like okay i like this crew already this is great yeah picker is a bomb yeah, yeah and like they have that kind of band of brothers feel to them you Definitely. know from that hbo show so they're just super tight but always you know super irreverent so there's also an element here where we love the bridge burners because they're kind of underdogs. They're also, there's this betrayal that's going on here. They're being culled from the empire because as you know, having read this book, Empress Lassine basically took over the empire from the previous emperor, Kellenved, and his right-hand man, Dancer. Oh, and so we got to talk about that a little bit, obviously, because I think this is not a spoiler because they do appear in the book uh, as other characters. And the, uh, the fact of the matter is the bridge burners are part of this got to get rid of the old guard kind of thing. Wipe them out. No more loyalty to the old emperor. And Whiskey Jack, you met him in the prologue. He was, what was he, uh, Iskar, was he a high fist or he was definitely a, a much higher oh, level commander? Happened. I didn't catch yeah. that with him. Someone had to tell me that part. Yeah, so he's, yeah. Been, he's been demoted to sergeant. And obviously this group, it seems, is being targeted for annihilation. 
And it's kind of a, you know, I think that's one reason also we kind of were rooting for the bridge burners, you know? I hate Tatron. Hate yeah. him. <laughs> hate him. Don't I you feel a little bad for him, though? Like a... Yeah. Do I feel bad for Tatron? Not even a little bit. No. No. I, do, I, I don't. I don't feel bad for Tatron at all. I want him to, I want to be punched in the face by Callum and Quick Ben. <laughs> That's my favorite buddy cop right there, Callum. Yes, oh, yes. I, I want to know, I wanna know his backstory. Like, I think with 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 Whiskey Jack, I said I wonder what he did to get demoted or whatever. And I think they mentioned he was like arguing with dancer on the battlefield, and that's kind of what got him demoted. But I think there's obviously more to that. But I more I want to know about Kalam being a former claw. I want to know what that's all about. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that it goes back to the prologue. You know, is that Whiskey Jack kind of wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't sit there and, and keep his mouth shut when Lacine was, you know, setting Tattersail loose on all the mages and they're trying to ban, you know, magic at first. And she was just going into kind of total crackdown mode and, and seize all control and try, try and be that absolute uh, authority. And so, but, you know, Callum being a claw and, and this is something you'll enjoy when you get to the, to the second book, cause you do explore his backstory a little bit, but he's just such a, uh, crazy badass that even like amongst his peers he's like kind of um, you know next level and and you kind of see that even with like um, you mentioned tallow goes down super easy to those like tist and e mages but you know callum takes on like a pack of them and leads them on a wild goose chase and ends up killing Quick a bunch ben of them isn't stuff. exactly a slouch with the old warrens either so he, he and he's a uh, seven seven cities right so i guess i get to learn more about that stuff there but yeah very very intrigued with quick men's backstory how how is he in what the realm of the shadow i think it was called or whatever like, yeah there or something like dude there's so much going on right now <laughs> Uh, you'll you'll get plenty more of quick ben everyone wants to hit quick ben in the face because quick ben always kind of has an idea of what's going on and has some plan going on but he won't ever tell anyone and it makes everyone super mad and they just like i'm gonna kill you quick ben like if we didn't <laughs> you i would kill you because they he's, just, he's arrogant like quick ben is just super arrogant but quick ben and callum are it, i mean they're they're awesome yeah. And a fount of mystery, right? Because it's even, you know, these people who are like supposed to be like next level people like the mage cabal in, in Darugistan at the end. And then like Quick Ben comes rolling up as this like squad mage. And they're like, oh my God, that dude just opened up seven warrens at once. Like, you know, and so he's always like, you know, tripping out even the most G'd up practitioners of magic that are like, whoa, who's this dude? Yeah, there are layers behind layers behind layers with Quick Ben. And I think he might be one of the characters with the most like theories, fan theories behind him. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna get to know him a lot more for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, can we talk about Sorry? Yeah. Yes. Uh, here's the deal. I completely missed this. People on the on the Discord hit on the real on. They 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 found it. What I said, okay, I saw that she was possessed by Cotillion. I never got the Rigolai part. And I was like, where did you guys get that? And then of course you get that confirmed later on. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a dummy because I can the completely- what? The what part? So Riga uh, she basically wax with twice in ten minutes. Yeah. So basically, what happens there in the beginning is you have this scene uh, through the prologue where this young woman—we don't know her real name, by the way—and uh, Riga, she's she's watching this uh, cavalry from the Malazan Empire ride by, and she's kind of admiring it. And this Riga yeah, old wax witch comes yeah. along and <laughs> says, "You know." This is not admirable. She's she's her her whole deal there is like she knows what empire does. You know she's like prod and pull. She knows how they manipulate people, how they grind people down. She knows she's lost husbands and and kids to the empire. So she's yeah maybe a little bit bitter about that. But so she's trying to give Sari a lesson here and say I pulls her by the hair and says no 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 this is not what this is. This is not some glorious thing here. And one of the soldiers sees this, bends down and hits her and apparently kills her with that blow. But one of the things that tips you off there is the fact that after Sari is possessed by Cotillion, what does she do? One of the first things she does is she spits and she says prod and pull. So there's the the clue there that Riga has also possessed Sari. And we know this, this is confirmed close to the end when the healer Mallet is basically trying to help this traumatized young woman. And he realizes that there's still, after Cotillion has left her, there's still somebody else in there. And that somebody else has been protecting, sorry, from just protecting her mind from what she has done while Cotillion possessed her. I mean, she's killed 
a lot of people in some pretty gruesome ways. So it's terrifying. She's terrifying. Yeah. 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 I was like, I'm glad that uh, Quick Ben's not the only one that's uh, freaked out by Star because, uh, yeah, right here, big time creeped oh, out. She's such but, a good character. She's like, she's so terrifying. Oh, yeah. That's a thing you'll see a lot. You, you saw it also with Tattersail dying and and being reconstituted along with Bellardan. Oh, y'all explain that. That whole, I didn't know what was going on. It's like 300,000 years ago or something. I'm like, what is going on right now? The Night yeah. Chill. Night Chill is this. Um, character who oh, goes way way girl. back and yeah, she, gets, she gets killed apparently at pale um and he's running around with her body parts in this bag and and all of that uh let's just say that she's the kind of character who'd be much harder to kill than you think and so th there's there's um there's an element here where i don't want to get into spoilers but you will see many times in the series where more than one spirit can occupy a single body. So it's, it's, it's one of these deals here. When you have uh, this new entity, you, Silver Fox is a combination of Nightchill and Tattersail and Bellardon. So- Oh, it, I didn't think about Bellardon being in there too. Okay. Oh, he's in there too, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't like Silver Fox. That should be, just go ahead and state it. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, I like Tattersail a lot. So I was okay, like, I, yeah, I don't, I don't cool. Um, RIP or that, yet, but yeah, I, I don't know. Take that like of Tattersail and none of it is even there with Silver Fox. <laughs> it's just, ugh. I can't wait to actually see what you think because I am not a, I'm not a Silver Fox fan. And, and Tattersail was out there getting pursued and whatnot too, but we had like Lauren and Tool out there, right? So she does this whole like, pre you know, preservation ritual and Tool's got his little like, you know, protective uh, Talon coating or whatever that's, that's out there in the desert. And so that's where you get like all these crazy side effects and whatnot that, that resulted in Silver Fox. Yeah. Yeah, did Tool have like the coolest introduction for a character ever, like stabbing <laughs> dude from, from, from nuts to neck. That was so awesome. I was like, oh, this is so cool. So, yeah, I liked him right away. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't we haven't talked about Tool and Talk the brief time they're together in yeah. this one before Talk gets hair locked into <laughs> into <laughs> Yeah, into I wanted to assume that uh, Talk wasn't dead. He's he, I think he went through some chaos warren or something. So I don't yeah. I don't know where he ended up. But uh I, I think that's way too pop this is the kind of thing that's bad is I know that he's too popular of a character for him to have been wiped out in the first book. Yeah. Talk about a guy who gets put through the ringer. Um talk yeah. based on <laughs> that stuff. Do yeah. you yeah you know how often when I'm reading I'm like leave talk alone Eric <laughs> talk alone like just leave him alone <laughs> erickson's punching bag <laughs> yeah his very first introduction his eye just gets blown out by like charred shrapnel and stuff so is yeah. that in the, is that in the 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 siege of pale that that happens yeah okay. yes yes and that's just the introduction so <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> oh man good stuff good stuff yeah Great stuff. Oh, and you get the tool comedy with talk too because he's always like making jokes and talks all afraid of him or he doesn't know like you know he's like the epitome of dry humor and talks like i don't know and then he's like yeah that was like a joke cool yeah. so a few times with lauren just uh, i read that like 10 times and i couldn't stop laughing i was like I, yeah i love this kind of dry humor it's good stuff tool's hilarious yeah, yeah tool, dry tool. dry being the character so far. That's indeed turning it does yeah. yeah you could call it desiccated humor that's right <laughs> i'm so i'm so excited for the for the dead house gates one of these like dead house gates is one of my favorites of the books oh i'm so excited same here same here yeah this is going to be a lot of fun anything else you guys want to bring up uh hey i want to look at my notes because while i got I, you guys. i want to mention ganos because you know you get like a, you know a lot of cool gano stuff in this book and and especially like you know well, he, he survives death he goes to hood's gate he uh i love how he he kind of grabs Oppen by the lapels and shakes the crap out of him. Uh, you know, here's just like a regular dude that just, uh, you know, very like force of nature almost, right? And and he has like, he's not the hero of the story, but uh, he, he is a really cool kind of, um, you know, like Peter character from the office. He's kind of like the bus driver that takes you scene to scene in some ways. And, and he's a, a really fun guy to kind of ride shotgun with. Yeah, yeah, cool that you mentioned Opon too, and the gods in there. They, they're sort of the chaos elements, the you know, the coin and all that. Yes. 
good stuff. Mike, you had a question or a statement? Uh, I was just going to say, I like the uh, Dujek one arm a lot. I can see oh, yeah. why his men want to follow yeah. that thing. I think he's awesome. I love that they were basically like, look, we got to get rid of this old guard, except for Dujek because he's just too important. And Tayshren's like, no, we got to get rid of him. And he's like, no, we'll get rid of you before we get rid of Dujek, right? Yeah. Uh, but not just that, but he keeps mentioning, I think, the Panion Domain. And yeah. I'm thinking, okay, this is obviously going to be important later. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm it's literally the plot of book three. Okay, great. I, he dropped the name too many times for it just to be, you know, world building. It was obviously literally the plot there. of book three. Outstanding. I mean, that's apparently the one that makes everyone sad. So I can't. Wait. Everyone. There are some, some of the best moments in the series are in Memories of Ice. Like there is, there's a siege in that that is one of my favorite sieges in fiction. Like Erickson wow. writes. He writes war so well. And this is why, even though I have complaints a lot of times about, you know, the philosophizing and some of the, like, just the dense stuff that I don't really need to be dense, like the, the, <laughs> the military stuff, like, I just, I just don't. I don't like working when I'm reading. Um, it's, it's just so good. Like, he writes military action so freaking well. Like, it's so good. Man. I like the action, but I'm also, like I said, I'm a big Frank Herbert guy. So I'm here for the philosophizing. If it's, uh, if it's done well, and it's not preaching You're in for a treat. Yeah. Yeah. You'll like it then. It's got the right mix of uh, philosophy and fireballs. <laughs> <laughs> like, as long as it isn't just being like, Hey, well, I'm just going to go off on a rant now that has nothing to do with my series. And it's like, okay. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm here for it. Like if it gets to like God Emperor of Dune level stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in for that kind of mind just explosion. I'm pretty optimistic, Mike, that if you liked Gardens of the Moon this much, I believe you're going to love the series. 100%. Like a series. Like a, I'm like what Alan said. I don't want to have to work, but I don't mind having to think. I don't mind having to chew my food. And this definitely seems like the kind of series that you're not just going to gorge. You're going to want to chew your food. And that's why people are like, oh, you got to read them faster than that. You'll forget everything. I'm like, first, I got a good memory. I'll be fine. I took over a year to read Wheel of Time. I was fine. I took a six-month break. But I also wanted to take the two years to make sure that I absorbed it the way that it sounds like it needs to be absorbed. So that's why I'm doing it that way. There was, there was <laughs> four months between Dust of Dreams and me reading Crippled God. And I didn't, I didn't forget anything, like yeah. um, anything like major. Yeah, you should savor it, not, uh, not wolf it down. That's my opinion. Yeah. I think the pace you're doing for your read-along is perfect. And you're perfect. bringing a lot of new readers in, which is, you know, kudos to you for that. That's, that's fantastic. It's cool. I just want to get a sword named Dragon Pur. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> dragon Purr is awesome. I love Dragon Purr. I call it Dragon Purr. So I'm imagining a dragon with like a pet cat. I don't know. I'm, I'm weird <laughs> with stuff, guys. Weird. Love it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? I think we hit. I think we hit everything. Is there anything that we didn't talk about? Any uh, just Crocus, I guess. And, and the Crocus coin, coin bearer thing. I got very Fellowship of the Ring vibes from that. How are you not going to or whatever? But I, I think was I the only one who was like when he finally talks to chalice and he goes about it the complete stupid teenage boy kind of way like yeah kidnapping is probably a bad idea if you're really into this girl but uh then basically finding out she even thought you were someone else that's why she was excited and i was like well look who just caught up you realize that uh yeah she was not into you at all she doesn't even think about you let it go but i do think throwing the coin overboard that that seems way too easy way too easy you'll see you'll see plenty of girls. i figured yeah, Crocus is that uh, teenage character that uh, frustrates you because he was you, right? Like his terrible communication. He likes sorry and stuff, but he's mean to her and all, you know, and it's like, dude, if you could just like actually, um, you know, be honest with yourself and then communicate that out, you'd probably be in pretty good shape. Yeah, but yeah. Crocus is a, is a main character in book two. So you'll, you'll get plenty of him. Oh, man. great. See, I was under the impression that I wasn't going to see a single character from this book in book two. So it's, um, no. You'll see Callum, uh, Crocus, Absalar, um, Fiddler, and, Fiddler, because oh, right, they're, oh, they're taking Sari back to Itko Khan, right? Okay, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Or am I calling her Absalar now? I'm sorry, I forget. Yeah. It's Absalar. That's that's appropriate. And I love Fiddler. Fiddler is just one of, if not my favorite character in the whole series. Well, first I, I was like, why are they calling him Fiddler? Oh, he carries a fiddle. I guess that's, a that's, fiddle. that makes okay. sense. <laughs> it's broken, but he does carry it around, and he's the one character. He appears in all the books. Is that right? Is there not many of them, but not is he in book? He, I don't think he's in book he eight. Might not be in five. Oh yeah, five. Five. definitely not five. Yeah. I don't think he's in eight because eight is yeah. I don't think he's in Toll the Hounds. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, is close. Rake really the only character that's in all ten? That's what I've been told. No. Who? Rake isn't. Okay. No. There's almost no one that you know is in five. I figure. I figure. 
People have told me Midnight Ties, just be prepared. It's just like a side quest. Just be ready for it. It is my second favorite of the books. I oh, love that's it. what I've also heard. That it is also very, very good. It's just, it just feels so different than the rest of the series. Yeah. You'll meet some of the best characters in Midnight Tides. That's my nice. favorite character of the whole series is in Midnight Tides. Great. Is it T-Hole or Bug? It's T-Hole. Yes! Love it. Yeah. Right yeah. now, I got I got I got Tool, then Rake, and then I think Crone. I like Crone a lot. Anytime you got a shaping bird that can talk and turn into a dog, uh, that's that's someone Mike. I like. No, you cannot like Crone. Crone is the <laughs> worst. Very John Gwynn to me. It feels like a very John Gwynn character. <laughs> I hate the crow in John Gwynn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love Animal hey. Companions. It's a weakness of mine. That's why I, I think I'm going to really like Robin Hobb because apparently he's got a lot of uh, Animal Crone. Companions. Oh yeah. <laughs> she's like she's like crap you know she's the animal version of a crap maybe he's the one she's just... ma, 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 ma! <laughs> <laughs> well this is why i don't listen to audiobooks guys because if he really makes these noises uh... <laughs> that's literally that's literally my own noises when i read it i think going all the way back to uh gunslinger Stephen King that had a you know a talking a talking bird and I, I've just I've always been a fan of talking crows and uh, and yep. animal companions of any sort and obviously a Song of Ice and Fire so yeah and Gwyn like you said yeah that's uh, and uh, Faithful in the Fallen uh, yeah so awesome and uh, Circle Breaker is uh, kind of a minor character but an interesting Ooh, witness cool. you know yes. I love what Erickson does I was at the laughing end. at his name <laughs> yeah it's like I can't wait for a character named Hexagon or something this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, I love Circle Breaker. He is a guy like like who has a wife and like is putting his like family at risk. Felt like an everyman. This. Yes, like yes. 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 Circle Breaker I, is so well done. That is deliberate. He is an everyman. Yeah. He's also um, in a way he's Erickson's own kind of uh, observer persona in there, witnessing all of this. And it's very appropriate the way it ends with Circle Breaker just kind of watching them in the boat and everything else. So he does a lot of meta narrative stuff with characters like Circle Breaker and Krupp yeah. and others, which is, I, I personally love this stuff. I think it, it, it adds layers to this that uh, I just admire love, immensely. Love yeah. Oh, one more before we go, please. Uh, it, can Kroll only, Kroll, am I saying it right? Kroll? Yep. Kroll? Yep. Can, can uh, he or she, I'm not even sure, can they only appear in Krupp's dreams right now? It's not actually like a, a physical being. It's only someone that's like in someone's eye. Because I, I got the whole point about the blood in Jerusalem. That's kind of what awakened uh, Krull. But I, I didn't understand if it would, if he was actually there or if it was just in Krupp's like visions or dreams. So when I, I think we won't say too much. But what I will say is that Krull is a much weakened elder god. Yeah, and, and I'm still trying to figure the difference between elder gods and ascendants. I think I have an idea, but I, I'm definitely not sure yet. Do you, yeah, do when, you want to know? Well, I, I say I, I figure like elder god or like basically like uh, uh, Mount Olympus, the gods watching us from on high, whereas ascendants are pre people clearly that were humans and ascended to godhood eventually. That's that's kind of how I look good. at it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. And when your buddy Talo Kafar got assassinated out on the, the uh, I got on that. the yeah, then that was you know gave him a little kick in the pants. Yep. You'll see you'll see more of Crow. Oh, you'll see. Okay. I love it. I love Raffos. Those are good for you. Yeah. Nice. All good. right. Anything else, guys? All right. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. I want to thank each of you. I've had a blast as always. Not thank you. You know, just talking the Malazan Book of the Fallen, but talking with you three. And I really appreciate your presence on BookTube and I appreciate that you're nice to me. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a really cool thing that we've gotten ourselves into here. So thank you very much for being part of this community. Thanks for, Thanks for hosting. I'm sorry if I, if I derailed your, your topic so much. I've just, I needed to get no. some of the stuff out. <laughs> I haven't really talked to anybody about it yet, except on Discord. So. Oh, it was so perfect. It was yes. absolutely exactly what I was wanting. So thank you. Me too. A lot of fun. Yeah. All right, you guys. Take care. Yeah. See you on the